A lot of people ask me how I became the chairman of the Black Panther Party. And by the way, I was never the chairperson, the chair or the chairwoman. I was always called the chairman of the Black Panther Party because that was the post I took over. And so that post was called chairman. And so uh, I was called chair <laughs> chairman uh, because we weren't that worried about, you know, being called chairman versus chairwoman versus whatever it was at that moment. Um, and they asked this question as though there's some kind of biz something bizarre about a woman being the head of the Black Panther Party or like how did a woman become the head of the Black Panthers presumed to be a male dominated uh, paramilitary organization and actually was a male dominated uh, paramilitary uh, revolutionary organization. And they asked this as though I'm some sort of left-leaning Condoleezza Rice, you know. <laughs> and we know she's not a sister, so she can't fall into, fall into that category anyway. And uh, neither is Hillary Clinton, by the way, so let's get that out the way. Um, <laughs> well, who is that? Am I getting a yes and no from somebody? Am I getting call and response? Good. That's good. I love that. All right. That's right. So, um, uh, but the point is, um, I've had a guy, I've had guys uh, and, and people questioning, you know, and, and I love to recount this story because, you know, it's one of those stories where you, you say something and you had the right answer at the right time, but you just, it, it's almost impossible to believe. But he, so many people were angry with this guy for asking the question. I had time to think of a good answer. So this was at Spelman College. I'm just checking the time to see where we are. This was at Spelman College some time ago, and the guy said, well, I heard that you slept with uh, Eldridge Cleaver, and you slept with Bunchy Carter, and you slept with Huey Newton, and that's how you became the head of the Black Panther Party. And so people, all the sisters of Spelman, there was like 400 women in the room. This is a bad place. You know, this was like my crowd, okay? <laughs> like, how dumb can he be? And people were like, I had, to, I had to stop the mob from lynching him. You know, it's like, please don't kill him, you know? <laughs> and so I said, he said, well, what do you say? I said, well, the first thing I say is it's a lie. I never slept with Bunchy Carter. <laughs> and I also say that Eldridge Cleaver slept with half the women in the state of California at the time. And Huey Newton certainly slept with the other half. And if he didn't, if he didn't, they tried to sleep with him, trust me. And the interesting thing is that none of those women became chairman of the Black Panther Party. So when we talk about an analysis, we always have to have a correct analysis based on concrete facts, right? I'm fine, thanks. Based on concrete facts. And so the question is, uh, uh, so all these women that, that slept with Eldridge, slept with Hugh and so forth, did not become chairman of the Black Panther Party. So what can we conclude? We can conclude either that was not the criterion, or I was the baddest sister in the state of California at the time. <laughs> Either way, I'm not sorry about it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, and then that goes along with the other question that comes up about uh, the question of gender in the Black Panther Party is, well, weren't the Black Panthers chauvinists? Well, what do you think? We got these brothers from revolutionary heaven? Of course. <laughs> we live in a patriarchy. Uh, do you think they suddenly arrived from some other planet and became different that none of us was a, a, a victim of our own history, we all are. And the women were chauvinists too, in the sense that we, many of us, had to be retrained and had to rethink uh, who we were. We became not, uh, we didn't talk about gender roles, however, like what does a woman do, do women cook or men cook? Although, you know, it got to a point where some people thought that women uh, should be the cooks, except when we started our free breakfast for children program, and everybody, because it was a paramilitary structure, you uh, basically took orders. And so if you, if you were ordered to work in the breakfast program, that's where you worked and you got up in the morning and you cooked breakfast for children. And we did that across the country as the chapters of the Black Panther Party spread. And certainly many, many brothers, as well as sisters, there was no particular gender as to who was going to cook breakfast, serve breakfast, or anything else. Same thing with weapons. Uh, we didn't think that uh, this, was, uh, this was that uh, women shouldn't learn how to uh, be, uh, be uh, proficient with, the, with weapons, and so everyone had to be trained on weapons. And so that changed the dynamic. In other words, the concrete conditions began to change the culture of things. Uh, you can't change the culture from, from outside. It has to be something different. And, and so what happened is we began to examine ourselves in many different ways as to who we were in terms of gender. And so we began to call each other not only brother and sister, but comrade brother, comrade sister. And after a while, we just dropped the brother and sister and just became comrades because we were, more than anything else, considered ourselves to be revolutionaries. And so we began to not think of ourselves even as men or women, but as uh, revolutionaries. So we created a kind of um, 
internal different culture. But of course, that wasn't our goal to perpetuate and institutionalize the Black Panther Party as some sort of a model of gender equality. Our goal was liberation. Uh, our goal was freedom. And it was specifically freedom uh, for black people in the beginning. Uh, we talked about how we achieve that freedom. And in order for us to understand how to become free, we had to understand the nature of our oppression. And we had began to understand that the nature of our oppression was there was a fundamental problem. It was, it was within the scheme of things in America. And so therefore, the scheme had to be changed. And we called for revolutionary change in order to have black liberation. You had to make some kind of fundamental change. You know, John Paul Sartre said that hell is a place where by design, nobody gets his or her needs met. Where by design, hell is a place. Of course, we must be obviously living in hell as we speak, but we recognize that our oppression was by design. It was a part of the scheme of things that built this country. And so in order for us to be free, we had to change the design, the scheme, and we had to have another, uh, uh, another idea in mind for what kind of social construct did we want. Now, there are people who say that they are anarchists, um, and uh, we could discuss that. Although I'm not here to talk about theory because I'm, I'm big on practice. <laughs> you know, word, Che Guevara said, words are beautiful, actions are supreme. So my thing is to talk about uh, the question of what did we do and what could we do to become a free. Now we recognize that the liberation of black people was our goal and it was our goal. That was what we then came to call our subjective goal, meaning that it was what we wanted. We didn't care about too much else at that moment. We wanted to be free, and we knew we were not free, and we expressed that in our 10-point platform and program. We talked the first point starts out by saying we want freedom. So the first thing about that was we had to recognize that we were not free in 1966, we black people. But we also recognized that as a matter of principle and as a matter of practice and practicality, we could not achieve our freedom through any type of fundamental change without recognizing some other issues. One, that there were other oppressed people in America. So how could we talk about the freedom of black people in the context of the oppression of, say, the Native Americans, OK? How could we talk about we were free, but let the, just let the Native Americans? You know, it's the way today there's this whole Mexican black thing that people are trying to whoop up all over, especially in places like California or Georgia, where I live. Uh, if you can believe, Georgia actually has a very fast rising population of Mexicans uh, coming in. And you have black people that live where I live in Brunswick, Georgia which I like to refer to as the Confederate Third World. <laughs> Not only are we in the Confederacy, but we don't even have the, uh, the benefits of the uh, bourgeois uh, high-tech universe. So we're kind of the Confederate Third World down there in Brunswick. And uh, I have some black friends who will tell me in a minute that the Mexicans are coming to Brunswick, which nobody's ever heard of, coming to Brunswick and going to take their job. You know what I'm saying? And this always makes me laugh because most of these people haven't had a job in 10 or 15 years, you know? So what job is it they're talking about somebody taking? I don't know. And this whole business of whooping up this kind of thing. But we recognized in the Black Panther Party that there was no way to talk about the freedom of black people without recognizing that we had a duty to understand that there were other oppressed people, at least minimally understand it. And so what we did was we helped to form and formed a coalition with the American, Indi Indi American Indian movement called AIM. Leonard Peltier, still in prison today, like so many other, not only political prisons, but just prisons, because as far as I'm concerned, they're all political prisons, and we can talk about that too. Leonard Peltier is still in prison because of wounded knee. We said, how can we talk about the freedom of black people in the context of the oppression of the Chicano population, especially in California, where the Black Panther Party started, which was picking all the food that America ate, 50% of it being grown in the state of California, just like the slaves of another time had picked all the cotton and so forth and so on. He said we couldn't, and so we, we helped to form and formed a coalition with the Brown Berets. Huh? And not only that, we formed a coalition, of course, with the Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. And you might think that's nothing, but let me tell you something. When we said we were going to boycott Gallo grapes with the, with the farm workers, you have to know how important a, a bottle of, a short dog of Gallo, a Gallo wine was to, in the ghetto at that time. That was the, the choice, uh, the drink of choice. So we, we sort of outlawed the drinking of the Gallo uh, short dog with lemon juice, which used to be called uh, Shake em Up. It had another name, but I don't want to tell you what that other name was. <laughs> it was a little rougher. But anyway, 
And uh, we said, talk, how can we talk about the freedom of black people? Uh, and you had other oppressed groups, Puerto Ricans, particularly in, in uh, New York, working the sweatshops of America, making the clothes that now Mexicans make, you know, all the various clothes uh, that are being made by us in sweatshops even today. My mother was a sweatshop presser. And so we said we couldn't. And so we helped to form and formed a coalition with the young lords out of, uh, and the same thing with poor white people. Uh, coming up, especially living in the north, the urban the shift to the north, the migrations were not only among blacks, but poor whites coming up from Kentucky and Mississippi into Chicago looking for the same thing everybody else was looking for, a job, and, and not finding one and thinking black people were their problem. But what we did was we helped to form and form a coalition with an organization called the Young Patriots out of Chicago, headed by a guy named Slim Coleman, sort of like a left-leaning Timothy McVeigh. And, um, and, and as a matter of fact, this is what Fred Hampton coined the phrase uh, when we talked about it. He, we used to talk about black power to black people and yellow power to yellow people and red power to red people, brown power to brown people, pe white power to white people. We talked about the revolutionary rainbow coalition, which Jesse Jackson has obviously usurped and tainted with a totally reactionary uh, theories uh, that he uh, maintains. So we realized that, um, and the Red Guard, and various unions, the United Farm Workers that I've mentioned, the United Auto Workers and so forth. Beyond the United States, we realized that our struggle was connected to, and we formed a coalition with the PAC in South Africa. And we formed a, a coalition uh, with uh, Frelimo in Mozambique, and with uh, ZANU in Zimbabwe. And what about our friends in Palestine? And so we formed a coalition very serious. These were not nominal coalitions, very serious with the PLO, and in Northern Ireland with the IRA. You didn't know that one, did you? That was a surprise, wasn't it? <laughs> I love to make that surprise. <laughs> because we put money behind the campaign of Bernadette Devlin, who became the first Sinn Féin person elected to the uh, parliament, if you, if you realize or know that history at all. Of course, we had our friends in Vietnam. And we not only supported, we not only opposed the war, we supported the right of the Vietnamese people for national liberation. And we, we supported their victory for the Viet Cong, which of course got us into a lot of trouble with the United States government because we not only called for the end of war, but for victory for the Viet Cong. But in the end of the day, there were other groups of people that weren't just na uh, national or ethnic organizations or groups, but we talked about women's liberation. How could we talk about the liberation of black people when half the country and half the world was oppressed? And we said, we saw women's liberation as a part of our struggle for black liberation. Now, you might not think that sounds like very much today, but you can rest assured you never heard SCLC say that. You never heard, matter of fact, SDS say it. You didn't hear very many groups at all calling for women's liberation as a part of the overall struggle uh, for liberation and for the end of all forms of exploitation, of human exploitation. We also said, how can we talk about our liberation in the face of the oppression of gay people in America? And we call for gay liberation as a part of our struggle. We really took some hits on that one because, uh, and this is 1970, right? And so we took some heavy, heavy hits on the whole notion that gay liberation was a part of our struggle. And we talk, talked about the liberation of people who were being shut out of society because of their physical disabilities. And so we joined forces with the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. And they called them, they were a militant group of crazy, uh, wheelchair wielding people who called themselves the Quad Squad and who used to roll up in anywhere, knock down chairs, and say, you don't want to open up this door, we'll open it up ourselves. And so that's what, we, that's what they did, and that's what we did with them. And what about the elderly? So as you well know, there was an organization that came out of the Black Panther Party called the Gray Panthers. And what about the environment? Can we talk about the liberation of black people in the context of the pollution of the entire planet by these re very same reactionaries who oppress us? And we said we cannot. So we started to work with the Trust for Pu Public Land and developed a program called Gardens in the Ghetto. So you can see that the bottom line was to recognize the world relationship to our struggle, that we were a part of oppressed people throughout the world, and that our struggle was a part of theirs, and theirs a part of ours. And we talked about global revolution, we talked about international revolutionary change, and of course this got us into a whole lot of trouble with the FBI and the CIA and any of all these other various armed, uh, rogue arm <laughs> people running uh, this world. The point is that that was then. And what is happening now? We have lost the ideological thread, haven't we? We are in the gender question. We are thinking that this is all about the video, the bootylicious video. You have Don Imus coming out talking about somebody as a nappy-headed hoe. Now, the only thing that should happen to him is somebody should have knocked him off his feet 
and well, and of course you should have been fired and all that little stuff, but that's that's the detail. What kind of person would think that Don Imus's comments came from hip hop? What kind of an analysis is that? This is so stupid to say, oh, wait a minute, some brothers from the hood have now created the dynamic that A, allows and justifies a Don I Imus, and though it arose in 1970-something. Like before that, everybody was fine, but here comes some thugs from the hood who have created this negative image of black women, and suddenly that's the problem. It's not a correct analysis, is it? And why is it not a correct analysis? It's like these sisters I know at Spelman and went crazy a couple years ago because Nellie had a, a, a video out called Tip Drill. Everybody was like, oh my God, it's the video. It's the video, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, war is raging in Iraq, but let's not worry about Iraq, you know. Let's go to the Tip Drill video and call that the main piece that we want to talk about today. And so they shut Nellie down from coming to Spelman College as it, who actually was coming there not to do a concert at the time, but to try and raise awareness about uh, transplant, organ transplants for blacks because his sister was dying and did die of uh, leukemia and needed a bone marrow transplant and so forth and so on. But that wasn't the point. The point I'm making is that there's a misanalysis and there, we have drifted the way black people have drifted. We've drifted into some other, some other thing. We've lost the ideological thread and that's why we don't know what to do. We have no foundation for what we're thinking. We think that, you know, the gender issue is what I like to call a bourgeois feminism. You know, the Gloria Steinem set. Uh, let me make it clear. Okay, uh, so let's talk about people talking about uh, reproductive rights, forgetting that there are Latinas in the world who happen to be Catholics who happen not to believe in abortion and feel imposed upon in many ways by people who talk about abortion as the number one issue for women. You have a woman like Fannie Lou Hamer, whom I consider to be as revolutionary and forward thinking and, and as much of a sister as anybody who absolutely opposed abortion. How are you gonna denounce Fannie Lou Hamer? You cannot denounce Fannie Lou Hamer. So we have to decide what is our agenda as women. We've gone far away from equal pay. Remember that part? Remember, there used to be people talking about equal pay for equal you don't even remember that, do you? We're not even having the same conversation. There used to be a call for women's liberation. But what we are doing now is we're talking about music videos, vagina monologues, Don Imus, thinking that, uh, looking at Oprah and Hillary Clinton as success stories, because that's what it'll be if we continue on this path, or we'll think that an out lesbian general in the United States Army is a success story. We got to be careful about where we're going with what we are thinking. We have to have an ideological basis. Is it? Do we really want to have women generals who will go and kill other women in uh, in Iraq? That's right. Is that's not what we want? And so we have to get an analysis back into this agenda and get clear because if there's going to be action, we have to base it on something. You know, we used to say in the Black Panther Party that the gun is not necessarily revolutionary because the reactionaries have guns. It's the ideology behind the gun that makes it revolutionary or not. And so it's the ide ideology behind this movement. If we're only talking about cultural changes, like, okay, I want to be called, uh, I don't want to be called bitch, you know, <laughs> Well, okay, I don't think anybody's calling Condoleezza Rice a bitch. Well, some people aren't, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, but does that make, I doubt that George Bush is referring to her as a bitch. So we know he's not using that word, certainly not publicly. So now, is everything okay? No. This is a man who is perpetrating a mass murder and uh, a mayhem and, 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 and crimes against humanity all over the world. But he's not using the word bitch, so we have to be careful where our priorities, our priorities are, okay? And so I want to get to the, the main thing, or one of the main issues here, but I want to make note of this because what's so interesting about the Iraq war, or the war against the Iraqi people, is that, you know, the other day I heard uh, a figure of 500,000 people have been killed. 500,000 people killed, and, and we don't even think about it, it's like just some Iraqis just died because we don't see it. You know, we just get little snippets from some guy with some palm trees or something. You know, it's always the same set behind the newscaster's uh, voice. And, and so we don't get uh, any real information about what's going on. And that, and that, of course, is purposeful. And so we don't know about these people that are being killed. You know, the other day there was a, a confession by two cops in Atlanta who were among a team of cops who kicked in a, the door of a 92-year-old black woman, kicked in her door, and blew her away with 30-some rounds and had the nerve enough to say that they thought she had a dope house and actually have confessed that they planted dope in there after the fact, after they realized they were 
quote, in the wrong place. They, they weren't in the wrong place. They were in the right place. They, you know you haven't heard of any white woman's house being kicked, door being kicked in and being blown away and somebody thought it was a dope house? Come on, when's the last time you heard that one? You know? So the point is that this woman uh, um, uh, uh, was killed and the police uh, say, well, uh, you know, we made a mistake and they're gonna get 10 years in prison uh, for killing, uh, killing this woman. And of course her family might get a few dollars uh, from you know, some sort of a settlement that the city will make, and, uh, and that's it. But this is a country, my point is, uh, that is, that is guided by violence. And so we have to decide what kinds of things and strategies we want to do. The first thing we have to do is have a correct analysis. The real issue and the core issue is that women and our children are the poor people of the world, period. And half of them live below in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Hmm? So these are the facts. These are not the ideas. This is not what I think. This is not the video. This is not the I, this is not I don't like. This is not a subjective question. This is, these are the facts. Half the women, half the poor live in sub-Saharan Africa, and the majority of the world's poor are women and our children. The majority of women in prison, and of course there are over two million people in this country. We have the highest incarceration. We've arrived to have the highest incarceration rate in the world. The majority of women, the greater percentage of women in jails and prisons uh, is black. And yet we only are composed 13% of the uh, population. So that's just a fact in terms of women in prison. 65% of the children and women with AIDS are black people. Uh, we have the black infant mortality rate is double that of white infant mortality. Uh, women dying of breast cancer, black women die of breast cancer, double the rate of white women, even though we have less of a, a percentage of, uh, of uh, breast cancer uh, than white women, but die of a greater percentage. Uh, we have the highest percentages of poverty and certainly homelessness certainly among women and their children who are homeless, highest unemployment and underemployment rates, highest percentage of people on welfare. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, the worst situation is in Africa where, I like to make note, Coca-Cola is the largest <laughs> private employer. That's a, this is a sad day. And can you imagine that Coca-Cola is the largest private employer on the entire continent of Africa? Now, the reason I mention that is because we have to see that there are race issues as well, and there are other issues, so we have to see all of the situation where women are affected. But this country, of course, was founded on rape and murder, wasn't it? I mean, we talk about rape today like we talk about the little individual rape, rape, uh, rapist and the individual rape victim. My daughter is a, a victim of uh, rape. Um, and uh, when she was 15 years old, and didn't tell me about it until she was uh, 30, and uh, because she said that she was afraid that I would kill the guy that did it and uh, never has told me who it was. And of course, uh, I would have killed him. <laughs> but uh, she wouldn't have known about it. <laughs> so I wouldn't have worried her pretty little head over something like that. Uh, that would be after he had to come before her and, and apologize and do all that other stuff because I think that's the real necessary part for healing from, uh, from being violated as the person has to stand before you and ask for forgiveness and then you can blow him away. <laughs> But in any case, uh, the country was founded on rape and murder. Now, we talk about this year as a celebration of the 400th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown, which was really the first colony in America, long before Plymouth Rock and all that little stuff. Now, this was not founded by a group of people seeking a better life, religious freedom. This was founded by something called the London Company. This was about some money, sort of the way it is today. <laughs> the foundation is the government was the company, or the country was a company. And so we have the foreign and founding, and these people are celebrating. I just heard on the news coming over here, $30 a day to go and visit and tour <laughs> Jamestown during this great celebration. Now, this was, of course, the first place where slaves were brought into America in the 1600s. This was the place that the land was cleared by the murder and rape of the Powhatan Confederacy, all 30 tribes of Pocahontas' people, her daddy, and everybody else she knew who were, who were murdered. 30 tribes wiped out the blood running, and then they're talking about planting some tobacco. And of course, they needed some uh, blackbacks and had blackbacks to create uh, that tobacco product and that tobacco production. And that's how this, this country started. We go forward, when we get to Thomas Jefferson, we see him raping Sally Hemings. Now, we know, you know, there was a time when the Jefferson scholars would say things like, there was no Sally Hemings. This is some kind of black urban myth. You know what I'm saying? There was no Sally Hemings, but you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote everything down. If he got up in the morning and went to the bathroom, he made a note that Thomas Jefferson had gotten up and gone to the bathroom because he loved to talk about himself. And so he certainly, he certainly wrote about Sally Hemings. And so there it was, Sally Hemings, 
she was the daughter of Betty Hemings, but more importantly, she was the half-sister of his dead wife. Hmm? Half-sister of his dead wife. And when she had her first child by him, she was 14. Now, people say it was a romance. Can you imagine? Now, let me think. How does this go? You are owned by this other person who is 40-some years old. You have nowhere to go and don't know where you came from. Hmm? Your mother was the product, was the victim of rape. You are the product of rape. And it was rape. And we don't want to see because we, it's Thomas Jefferson. He was just a, he was just a man of his time, you know. It wasn't really like he really believed in slavery. He owned this girl. And he owned her until he died and she was never set free. Not that it would have mattered because where was she going to go in 18, whatever it was when Thomas Jefferson died, 90, 89, 90 years old, whatever it was. And Sally Hemings ended up having eight children by Jefferson. Now, when the Jefferson scholars argued about it, the first thing they said, as I said, there, there was no Sally Hemings. Then they said, well, there was a Sally Hemings, but she had no children. Then, of course, they looked through Jefferson stuff, and there was uh, Sally Hemings that had several children. They said, well, she had several children, but they weren't his children. Well, they said, well, all these children were red-headed children. And the way we know that is because Aaron Burr talks about how Thomas Jefferson had all these little red-headed slaves running around uh, Monticello. And there's all kinds of evidence about of the children of Sally Hemings, but the main evidence comes from him, and ultimately she had these eight children, and finally it's been acknowledged that, that he fathered at least one of those children, although there was, in the beginning, there was a notion that his nephew Randolph had fathered the first child, and Randolph was 12 <laughs> at the time that the child was born, but more importantly, <coughs> Sally Hemings had gone to France uh, to take uh, Jefferson's younger daughter to be with him when he was ambassador or uh, going to France as an ambassador in an ambassadorial uh, position and uh, she had stayed in France and come back pregnant so not only must Randolph have extraordinary uh, sperm count for a 12 year old but these are the strongest sperm on the planet because they obviously swam the Atlantic Ocean and figured out how to impregnate this child when she was living in France with Thomas Jefferson. But this is rape. It's rape. It's what it is. It's ongoing, continuing rape, kidnapping, and any other thing you want to call it. But we don't think of it like that because we, when we think of crime in America, we think of, usually we think of black people, you know. So the point I'm making is that we have to realize that this arises from something, not from nothing. This relationship and this oppression of women doesn't come from nothing. It doesn't come from some little decision. And so the question is, how do we make the kind of fundamental change we have to make? Now, recognizing that there was a time when a lot of women in this country were talking about women's liberation, meaning joining forces with other oppressed groups toward the liberation of all human beings, not toward equal equality with men to be able to oppress other people. That's not what our goal is, is it? Our goal is not to oppress other people, but to talk about the freedom of women and in the process, knowing that we represent half the world, okay? So, the, so today what we find is that, we, as I said, we've fallen, we've fallen away from that. Since the uh, whole question of suffrage and going forward to Roe v. Wade, uh, women have lost our way, just like black people have. That's why I say you end up with these Condoleezza Rice's, all these people are beneficiaries from the struggle, sitting there on the blood. All they, they know that, you know, Condoleezza Rice, and I like to use her name because she's just uh, so incredibly horrible that I don't even feel bad about repeating it, you know. Um, <laughs> well, gonna, you know, Bill Cosby had the nerve enough to talk about some ghetto names. Now, does anybody know anybody outside the ghetto who walk around named like Condoleezza? <laughs> name is Condoleezza. You don't know anybody white with the name of Condoleezza. Because it's a made up name. Her mother made it up. It is a made up name. Her mother tried to name her something after some musical thing, but I'm a musician and I know there's no such direction called Condoleezza, okay? Trust me on that one. <laughs> but in any case, what, what we've done is we've lost our way. We black folks have and so have women in terms of the women's movement. There isn't a movement, is there? It's kind of like a bunch of people running around doing different things in their little circles of people saying, well, I'm an AIDS worker, or I try to help the homeless, or I'm going over here to do, and we do, we do a lot of little stuff like that, all of us do. We're busy every day doing that stuff, but we don't have a cohesive ideological relationship with each other to develop a real movement in this country, okay? And that's what we have to get back to. Where are we going to go? Now, of course, we lost our way for reasons. We had, you know, uh, not only did we have, uh, uh, after we can say the, the, the death of King and after the 
uh, the demise of the Black Panther Party. We had the rise of uh, the Reagan era, which coincided, interestingly enough, with the crack era. <laughs> um, and that certainly uh, had a lot to do with how we began to uh, see ourselves differently and do different things. Women started getting little jobs, and so you got people like Elizabeth Dole talking about the, uh, the glass ceiling. And we began to think in terms of the glass ceiling, meaning we want to be in corporate America and break through the glass ceiling. And that's how we don't even realize what that means. We want to be corporate leaders, and we're happy being corporate leaders or being lawyers for corporations that are exploiting other people, the earth, everything, everything else, and see these things as success stories. But the worst moment came for me. The worst moment came under Bill Clinton. Now, you know, a lot of Negroes like to think that Bill Clinton was the first black president, which is amazing to me, although obviously I'm not one of them. But it's amazing to me because I can't figure out why. No one was more devastating to black folks or women than Bill Clinton. Yes. And for his wife to stand up there and talk about what a wonderful president she thought he was, I was glad to hear her go ahead and admit it. So now we know they're joined at the hip, whether they, whatever their relationship is otherwise, they're joined at the hip ideologically and so forth and so on. Clinton in 1993, in November of 1993, gave a speech. Now he hadn't even been in office a year. And he gave a speech in the last pulpit where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his last speech. You know that great speech in Memphis, Tennessee, when he says, you know, I, I'm not fearing any man tonight. I might not get there with you, but I've been to the mountaintop, seen the other side, know that we as a people going to get there. Remember that wonderful, wonderful speech that Dr. King gave in the last day, last day of his life on this planet. And here is Clinton desecrating this sacred spot with his very presence, but standing there in, the, in that Memphis church at that pulpit talking to these black parishioners and telling them that about what Martin Luther King would say if he had been alive at the time. I said, what would Martin say if he were standing by my side today? Not even counting the arrogance of the phrasing. What would Martin say? <laughs> now how is Clinton a little rotten racist going to be talking about what Martin Luther King <laughs> is going to be standing by his side doing? You know, when the central, when the central high children at Little Rock's uh, Central High tried to desegregate the school and they had to bring 50,000 troops in there just for nine children to go to school. And they were spitting on people so bad you could ring the spit, spout, spit out these children's dresses. I think Clinton was probably one of those people out there spitting. He was alive, he was, he was a kid, he was living a couple miles away in Hope, Arkansas. And here he is sitting up here talking about what, he was, what Martin Luther King would say to him. But anyway, in any case, so Martin Luther King's talking to Clinton, he says, and Martin Luther King would say, because now he's going to tell us what Martin Luther King, he, he, not only, he not only is going to imagine, he's going to answer his own question and tell us what Martin Luther King said. He said, and Martin Luther King would say to black people, I died for your freedom, but look what you've done with it. And everybody hung their heads low. All the little, the little Negroes out in the field, they said, oh, Lord, Master Clinton, come down here. <laughs> It made us feel bad. You right. We brought this on ourselves. There's <laughs> nothing wrong with America. It's something wrong with black people. He said, Martin Luther King said, I died for your freedom, but you, look what you've done with it. Look at all this black on black crime. Look at all these unwed black teen mothers. And look at the breakdown of the black family. Now, before I go further, we have to at least examine the absurdity of this comment, OK? <laughs> Because remember, my theme is always to have a correct analysis if we want to come to a correct conclusion and therefore a solution. We have to know the nature of oppression. We have to know to understand what somebody is saying in order. And our analysis has to be, as Marx liked to say, ruthless. Has to be ruthless. We have to, we have to look at it in a very serious way without dispassionately. Huh? Now here's Clinton talking about Martin Luther King said, if I die, I die for your freedom. First of all, Martin Luther King did not die. Martin Luther King was killed. So that kind of ch changes the whole nature of things. You know what I'm saying? It's a whole different thing. Martin Luther King died for your freedom, and look what you've done with it. Now that last part presumes that black people were free. And somewhere between the time Martin Luther King died and Clinton speaking in November of 1993, we had been free and messed up our freedom. <laughs> it's an amazing statement when you really think about it, isn't it? Now, I want to tell you children something because I know you weren't around in 1968, but I was. And on April the 4th of 1968, I was just about to join the Black Panther Party. And I knew we weren't free. And if I didn't know we weren't free for any other reason, Martin Luther King told us. He said, we're going to Washington, D.C. 
to cash our check. What is our check? We're going to get reparations for slavery. We're going to get uh, guaranteed income for everybody. The Poor People's Campaign. Whosoever will, let him come. We're going to get uh, guaranteed health care. And of course, the worst thing he said was redistribution of the nation's wealth. Well, you know, that was the one I think to put the bullet in his throat, you know. You're talking about messing with folks' money now, okay? <laughs> it's one thing to be crying about your wages. It's another thing to talk about taking all the money and changing it over and distributing it equitably among the people. That's a dangerous statement, and that's who Martin Luther King was. Not some mammy-pammy guy who only talked about nonviolence and had a dream that didn't nobody remember. And so here we have Clinton talking about Martin Luther King Died for your freedom. So I said, well, okay, on April 4th of 1968, I was living in California, and I, was, I went to sleep that night. Everybody was mad. Woke up the next morning, and America was on fire. Over 100 uprisings in cities by blacks. Blacks were tearing up America, talking about nonviolence is dead, and we don't care anymore. We're no longer in check. We're out of check now. We're going crazy. They, they couldn't find enough troops for all that stuff. And so everybody just burst up down. And I remember thinking that we weren't free because I, I was joining the Black Panther Party. And from that point for the next 10 years that I was in the Black Panther Party, I knew nothing had really changed in the status of black people, so we continued to be not free. So now we're already in the, into almost the 80s, <laughs> and I can't remember anything that happened. And by the time we get to 93, I'm trying to figure out when it is that we, got, we became free and then messed up our freedom. And the only thing I've always concluded in thinking about this is that, we were, that during the night of April the 4th to April the 5th, on Pacific time too, <laughs> that we were free. I slept through freedom, and when I woke up, we had messed it up in those few hours overnight uh, in uh, in California. And so, so this is this is the kind of absurd thing. But what did Clint, What was the more insidious part of this message? It wasn't just his poor analysis and his his racist analysis that there's nothing wrong with America. It's every opportunity. You know, we say that now. Nas running around here, people like that talking about, you can be Oprah. You're not going to be Oprah. <laughs> you are not going to be Oprah, okay? <laughs> they have one slot for Oprah, and she's filling it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we got one slot, and she's filling it. So what Clinton did that was so insidious, though, is he said, but I'm going to help you find a solution to your problem. <laughs> All that black-on-black -black crime? I'm going to give you the three strikes crime program. I'm going to make sure you put these bad people away, and especially these kids. These little bad boys, like little B, 13 years old. These people that scare everybody. You know, these little bad boys. Jesse Jackson even had the nerve enough to say, sometimes he gets nervous when he sees a young black man walking up behind him. I'm more concerned about young white boys with a backpack, you know what I'm saying? Because that's the group that's been blowing up a lot of strange stuff. But I'm, but, but, I'm, but I'm saying that not to be humorous, but to say how absurd it is to say something like this. But Clinton used that moment to get support for the three strikes crime bill. You'd be surprised who in the Congress voted for it. You really didn't hear of a whole lot of people not voting for it. Uh, many did, including uh, my former comrade, Bobby Rush. Hmm? That's right. Including Cynthia McKinney. Mm -hmm. Including a whole lot of people in the Black Congressional Caucus that uh, Kwaisi and Fumi, then the president, convinced that this had something to do with helping black folks. Yes, it helped us to go to prison. The prison population since 94, since that bill was passed, has doubled in this country. Doubled and become more long-term sentences, mandatory sentences, you know the drill. And more and more, of course, women going into prison as, even as we speak, huh? Thanks to the three strikes crime bill that Clinton said, if, it had, if we hadn't messed up our freedom, and everybody knew he was talking about black people, but look at the big net that embraced all the other poor who are sitting in the prisons of this country. And then, of course, how is he going to deal with these little Chantanay and them having all them babies out of wedlock? You know, we don't even like them. Now, what does it mean to have a baby out of wedlock? I don't know, because I was a baby born out of wedlock, you know, Ill classified illegitimate child. What does that mean? I have no idea. It's like these nasty, lazy, trifling girls living in the ghetto, laying up having everybody's baby. They want us to support them. We pay tax money. And so you had a whole liberal base of people who said, yes, I'm tired of taking care of them. They need to work. Where were the women? Jill Island standing across the street, head of now at the time, crying her eyes out. Wasn't nobody marching. Wasn't nobody complaining. Hillary wasn't saying a mumbling word. Wasn't saying a word. While Clinton criminalized poor women, 
targeting black women. He said, I want to help you with this problem of all this out of wed teen mothers having all these babies draining our society and our economy. I'm going to give you the welfare reform bill. I'm going to take that welfare from these lazy trifling girls. He didn't say bitches, but hey, I'd rather he said bitches and gave us a little bit of money than taking the money away and kept the bitch to himself. So my point is that he said, I'm going to help you to cure your problem because it's not America's problem. America's a land of opportunity. The only reason you sitting up here poor and, and not having any housing or any medical care or anything is because you're lazy, trifling, having children out of wedlock and committing crime. But I'm going to fix it right now. You're going to prison. And I'm taking away your money from your lazy little girls. As far as the breakdown of the black family, I guess this was all supposed to somehow magically bring the, quote, black family uh, together. In today, in Georgia, where I live, a, woman, a single mother with one child is eligible for $137 a month and $500 in food stamps, which just went up from $400. Now, I don't know how you can live on that without selling the food stamps. Food stamps, which of course many people do, but I'd be selling crack, quite frankly. If I had to live on $137 a month, I'd be selling something because I would not be able to do that. You know, when people talk about the question of intelligence and genius and you get people saying things like, well, uh, blacks can't learn. You remember the bell curve talking about some kind of inherent problem among blacks and all this kind of thing. Uh, I think of a woman trying to live on that. Now, for three children, you can get $300, by the way, and $500 in stamps. How do you do it? I mean, how, how's anybody expected to live? And so people don't live. Um, and, and, and here's the other twist. If you're an ex-felon, you can't get any of that. So later for your children, let the children die. We don't care because we're not helping you. Now, that's what we need to be talking about. Not lifestyle questions. Not whether anybody is a vegan. Not whether or not anybody. <laughs> and that's all right if you want to be a vegan. It's, I, I don't have anything against vegans. Obviously, I don't have anything against any of this, you know. But, I mean, there's people in Walmart buying big slabs of pork, and everybody's laughing at those people. But those people are some ordinary folks trying to make a, trying to make a way for their little family. And we get into lifestyle challenges and start looking down on people that shop at Walmart. That's right, that's right. And I like Walmart because Walmart has a tendency to show us the class relationships in America like no other place you can ever see. <laughs> You go to Walmart in Georgia, where I live, you're going to see Billy Bob up there, and he's going to be walking up and down, down the aisles with a big, uh, big Confederate cr cross flag on the back of his shirt and holding the hands of Shantiqua. And she's going to she gonna have some ghetto fabulous nails <laughs> and some hair. <laughs> Those of you who don't get these parts of the thing, just ask somebody, you know. <laughs> she's going she to have some hair. <laughs> And he's gonna be walking around there with a buzz cut, looking like something, got a truck outside with some gun racks on it, and got himself a black girlfriend. And they just, they feel like they in Walmart, you know. They, and then the other way, the, the other, it goes the other way where you got the, you got the, the black bro, the brother who's got a, a white girlfriend, and she walking around there with a child named Dontavious. And talking about Dontavious. Now, we gonna look at this for Dontavious. <laughs> Little Crystal Lake got Don Tavis for a child. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's a whole class relationship to everybody in Walmart. They understand who they are. It's those of us who think we're uh, advanced and conscious and, and, and we have a bourgeois mentality toward those people. We have taken the mentality that those people are people we don't really like because they're in Walmart, and there's exploited workers. Oh, really? Well, let me think. So there's some place where you shop where there are no exploited, <laughs> the non-exploited worker product. I love the people wear a shirt, but I say, well, where'd, your, where'd that cotton come from from that shirt? Well, you don't think it was some exploited cotton pickers that picked that cotton in the first place, do you? You know, you can go get some exploited workers when you buy that Sean John for $75, you know? But the Malaysian women or Nike shoes and all that other stuff that we know about. You can't get outside of it. But, but what I mean about Walmart, and I've been pr promoting this, and people get mad. The people in the Green Party really pissed off because I talk about the Walmart culture. They're like, what? Walmart? Yeah. You know, that's where the majority of America is. There are women in there on welfare trying to make ends meet at the Walmart, buying uh, pampers and meat, you know, all in the same place, you know. They ain't got no car, so they got to shop in one place when they get a chance. We forgot about that kind of stuff, didn't we? We've become very, very arrogant about the movie video, the music video. 
and forgot about the real issue. And what is the real issue? The real issue is the oppression, and that oppression is expressed in the poverty of our people, and the poverty of women particularly in this country. And so, and, and by the way, you can't even get, in Georgia, you can't even get Section 8 housing if you have a felony, an ex-felon. Now, what is an ex-felon? Most people think an ex-felon is somebody who, who shot somebody, right, or who had a gun some kind of way. You, you can get drug trafficking with two, two rocks of crack trying to sell, that, trying to sell those rocks to, 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 to hit the next piece, okay? And you're going to get drug trafficking, and you're going to prison. If you go to prison, you are a felon, period. That's the end of that. People say, well, let's just talk about the people who committed nonviolent crimes. That's most of them, believe it or not. Because if you come down to your, your basic rapist and child molester, you can believe me, they don't get to live too long in prison. They get beat up and beat down so bad most of the time. But as far as the women in prison, most of them are in there on drug cases or for defending themselves against their abusers. And instead of getting a medal, they get time. <laughs> uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But can you imagine that you cannot get Section 8 housing in the state of Georgia if you have a felony? So what are you supposed to do? Just live on the street, drop dead, let your kids die, and so forth and so on. Where, are our, where, is, where is our agenda for addressing that question? We need to do something about it. So the question I asked is the same thing that Martin Luther King asked many years ago, where do we go from here? When he talked about the continuing oppression of blacks, even in the face of the so-called achievements of the civil rights uh, movement in the sense of the 1964 Civil Rights and Voting 65 Voting Rights Acts. So where do we go from here when black people have half of what is good in America and double of what is bad? And we could say the same thing about women, couldn't we? Half of what is good and double of what is bad. As I said, we used to talk about a, uh, equal pay. We now have a lot of focus on reproductive rights and popular culture question. We need to set an a new agenda again or get back to an agenda and talk about the ideology that goes to the question of liberation. And the question is, do we want to rise up by putting down other people, making sure that others are still oppressed? Do, are we really happy with the idea of women achieving certain levels of, of you know, sort of in, among blacks, it's like Ebony Magazine stories, you know? When black folks get a job, they get the cover of Ebony because there's so few of us with a job. <laughs> we, we're on the cover. They have whole cover stories and color brochures on somebody with the first black head of this hoobie boo. And it's, there's never a second or third black. It's just, just that one black. But what we have to know is that change, the only way we're going to truly be free and have uh, the kinds of things that we need in the kind of society that we're talking about is that we have to talk about fundamental change, what we used to call revolutionary change. You don't have to use these words because some people get nervous when you say revolution. And I don't know why, because uh, uh, it's just uh, meaning a, a fundamental a change in the, uh, in the structure of the, of the country in, in terms of capitalism, in terms of distribution of resources, and so forth and so on. This is, this is what we want. We don't really want people to be hungry, do we? Nobody's voting for let them go hungry, you know, let people be homeless, let's have war. We're really not voting for that. So we're really voting for a different kind of social structure, but we're not really uh, achieving that. The question is, we have to strike for some type of fundamental change. But in the meantime, we have to talk about what we can do in the meantime. We know that there's not going to be revolution in our lifetime. Those of us who were in the Black Panther Party used to say revolution in our lifetime because we thought if we clicked our heels together three times, we were going to arrive in paradise, but it didn't work. Folks died and people got hurt and, and nothing really uh, changed. So what we had in the meantime, we had what we called survival programs, such as our free breakfast for children program, our free clinics and so forth. And our, we operated those programs under the notion of survival uh, pending revolution. In other words, People can't, it's hard to fight when you're hungry. You know what I'm saying? When you're trying to figure out how you're going to get from, like coming here. This wasn't no joke to get here. I mean, I had cab fare, but I don't know how you get here if you don't have some kind of car or you're not strong enough to ride a bike or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So um, you, it's hard to talk about, well, can we all come together when we can't even afford to, to eat or to, to do those things? So we have to have what we call survival programs. So I, I offer this as a, a thought. The first thing we have to do is, of course, organized to overturn welfare reform. We cannot allow this to continue to stay on the book. You can't impoverish these people. You can't continue to impoverish people. We think that gender issues have something to do with your identity. There are millions of women, and they're not all black. The majority of women affected by welfare reform have been white women, particularly white women in the South and in rural communities, which is why their children are going off to fight in war in the, in the majority numbers. 
We need to end welfare reform. We need to organize around that. Instead of sitting around talking about, you know, our little personal issues and how I feel about this one and, and why we're upset with Don Imus or not upset with Don Imus, I say, you know, my attitude is he should have just been blown away or whatever, you know. <laughs> just, you know, end the Don Imus kind of, Like that, that boy Michael Richards calling somebody a nigger. Call me one and see what I'm going to do. I told you. <laughs> I talked to the sisters earlier on. I'm a... I'm what is called bougetta, you know, bougetta, you know, that's a, a bougie ghetto, ghetto. So it's like, you might look bougie, but you have a ghetto mindset. I'll take these high heels off of Michael Richards, please. I'd have been on that stage so fast. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> you'd have seen, you'd have had the free Elaine program. You wouldn't have worried about why he said it. You'd have, want, you'd have been dealing with what I did. I, Cause you know, that, that heel, that little, this heel I got on, see? Six feet, I know I can make that. I'll take that left eye out or something. If it calls somebody a nigga, what is wrong with you? We're not going to have a discussion about why did he say it? What happened to him? Let's look into the depths of his soul. Did he really mean it? Not interested. We have to talk about getting rid of welfare reform. Why? Because people need uh, money. We know that everybody has, we want a society where everybody has enough to eat, don't we? Where there's not a price on food, you know right now there's a price on your head. You don't have any money, you can't eat. You might as well just drop dead. Really. You realize that if you don't have any money, you can't eat. It's like housing. If you don't have any money, you just might as well go on and stay out here in the cold. Now me, I'm not going to do that. Because if I, if I don't have a place to live, I was homeless one day in my life and it was a scary moment. I mean, I literally didn't have an address, you know what I'm saying? It's a scary thing to realize that you really, at this moment in time, don't know where you're going to sleep that night. And that one day in my life, and I was 22 years old, and I'll never forget it. I would never want to be out there in the streets like that by myself. But if I were, at this point, though, I have new skills. And uh, if I were homeless today, if I had no place to go, and I would, it would be cold or something, nighttime falls, you know? I'm looking at our houses, and people got lights on, having, having dinner, cooking little chickens and stuff. I'm coming in the door, okay? We gonna live together. It's all about what are we having for dinner, okay? And where is my room? We gonna share or you gonna get out? But I, I'm not leaving. I'm not staying in the cold by myself, no, uh-uh. We have got to overturn welfare reform because people are resorting to, you talk about the bootylicious video, let's talk about the club and the lap dancing and the girls that I know in Atlanta that are sitting up there lap dancing, lap dancing one second removed from turning a cheap trick. Sitting up there lap dancing because they can't get enough money to do anything else. And the only thing they get is child care. And you can't get child care for 3 o'clock in the morning anyway. That's what has happened to a lot of women. They have, have had to resort to the most desperate measures to live every day to take care of themselves and their children. We've got to end welfare reform as an interim measure in the march toward freedom and liberation. One of the reasons for that is this. You know, we talk about battered women. Most of the battered women go back to their batterers. Most of you know that if you've ever worked in, in any kind of shelter. How many people know what I'm talking about? That these battered women will go back. And the reason they go back is they ain't got no options. Now people say, well, it's because they, don't, they think they're dependent on their men. No, they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, they don't have a house, okay? And when you go to the shelter, you got a room, the kid's a man, you go, wait a minute. He didn't kick my ass but once every six months. I could put up with an ass with once every six months other than this room here in the battered women's shelter. And we're not providing any real and concrete options like a free breakfast for children, a free housing for battered women program for real, not a temporary shelter where you can run from your man and then he finds you and finds each other. All those terrible stories that we all know, okay? We gotta get rid of welfare reform so we can get some money back into Lisa. We have to fight to get to increase not the minimum wage. We need to talk about a living wage. I mean, what is a living wage? Well, I mean you gotta start with what, maybe twenty bucks an hour or something like this, twenty, twenty-five dollars an hour. Nobody can live on really less than that in a serious way. I know people think you can, but you really, you really you'll be much happier, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to think about this, particularly in occupations, um, um particularly in occupations where women are, are dominant, for example, in, in elementary school teachers. We need to get some elementary school teachers some money. That's where the heart of our education system is. A starting salary should be around $150,000. People think, oh, well, that's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. It's what we 
trying to raise some children up who can think for themselves and you don't want to pay the people that teach them the main things they ever want to learn in life? We want to skimp on teachers but pay, uh, you know, uh, entertainers more. I mean, you know, we have to make some commitments and some change. So we have to fight for that. We have to talk about women's health care. We, why don't we have free mammograms for everyone? Matter of fact, why don't we have free, free health care, period? What is the reason for that? I lived in France for seven years, and in France, health care is free. People go, well, how's it possible? It's socialized medicine. No, it's a commitment that the people made. We want our tax money and our, our contributions to go and make sure that nobody's without a mammogram or, or you know, people say, tell us friend. Get a mammogram. How are you going to get it if you don't have any money? Are you making decisions like, wait a minute, should I pay that $150 for that mammogram or should I pay to put my, that money toward my rent or my monthly food? Making economic decisions about our very lives. We need to do that. There was a free cancer clinic now in Harlem. And can you believe there's a brother named Dr. Friedman who got the money from, of all people, Ralph Lauren. And Ralph Lauren put up the money for a, heart, a cancer treatment center free in Harlem and he has shown the results have changed that the number, the, the length of time women have lived uh, that have been treated there has extended because they're getting early detection and early treatment sponsored by Ralph Lauren. Now wait a minute, you know we need to have to do better than Ralph Lauren. This is a disgrace. We need to talk about free cancer treatments and free medical care and we need to be fighting for these things and not sitting around arguing about little stuff. All these sisters in prison, we need to help to get them. Most of them in on drugs, as I said, or defending themselves. I have a sister I've been trying to get out. She did 10 years on uh, shooting a man by accidental shooting of a man that was uh, her beating her for three years. And as I say, and as I have said, uh, you know, instead of giving her a medal, they gave us some time. We have to talk about the education of girls, okay? We don't talk about that in terms of how children are being educated in, 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 in elementary school and that there should be free college for everyone. This is not, what kind of a country doesn't want to give people information that you need to make it a better place to live? So we need to fight for that. Of course, we have to end the abuse of women, but with practical programs. For example, when we talk about rape, we talk about battery, we've got to talk about, um, we've got to talk about ways in which we can uh, we can assist women to get on with their lives without having to worry about someone who has raped you and someone who has battered you. And there are concrete things that go to money, housing, not just counseling and hand-holding and all sitting around kumbayaing, you know what I'm saying, which I happen to like that song, so I'm not trying to do anything. <laughs> now, I want to close by saying this. You know, Malcolm X talked about the ballot or the bullet. And, uh, and that was what he meant, is what ways can we make change in America? Now, the majority of people are not prepared to deal with the bullets, so let's just talk about what we're really going to do, which is the ballot. Now, people say to me, well, why are you running for the Green Party nomination for president? Um, are you entering the system <laughs> as though we could step outside the system? The system is what you're mad at right now. The system is what gave us welfare reform and all these other These are the things that we're sitting around here crying and mad about right now. I'm only doing it primarily to raise consciousness, to get a national, national attention to the agenda that I just, just talked about and so forth. And uh, so I'm hoping to use that opportunity should I get that nomination. I do have some stiff competition, but I'm hoping to use that nomination to raise national consciousness, challenge these Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton people. And we're not even going to talk about the, the other people. They're just too obvious. All of these efforts, all these efforts are toward creating the conditions for change. And that's what we're going to try to do, hopefully get back to that agenda, toward revolutionary change, toward creating a world where there really is no more oppression and exploitation of women or any other people or of the planet itself. A world which by design, by design, every person will get her or his and his uh, needs met, where we will not be out without food or clothing or shelter or education or health care, and where we will realize what has always been promised and what we've always believed in, in these United States of America, the promise of life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And thank you very much. Oh, we'll have to re-up the room after that? Oh, okay. All right, well, we have to have limited questions or comments, so. Three to four, three to four. Hit it, if you want to say something. If not, look, we just chill out and play some music. Go ahead, sister, you too crazy, come on. You know you're out of line. I know.
Right. Yeah, <laughs> Aisha, Aisha Simmons. Simmons. Uh-huh. Um, can you talk about how you think the women's movement or women in general, women of color in general, have progressed or changed since your time in the Black Panther Party to the present? I think something we need a little just sort of a gauge from someone like yourself to give a little more historical perspective. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, but no was a film about uh, rape. Uh, you know, no means no. And it was produced, and it was primarily about black women who've been raped. And, and, and ironically, I did that. Uh, she interviewed me before I knew my own daughter had been raped, um, which was pretty painful. And I'm saying it uh, not, I'm saying it easily, but it's not easy. But there's no point in crying over because I'm not the victim of that shit. My daughter was, okay? Uh, I'm just sorry she didn't feel she could tell me and that I created the kind of crazy atmosphere that she didn't feel comfortable enough to tell me what was happening. Uh, and. Uh, and we, she and I have obviously examined and explored that in as much as possible. But, you know, um, I think that, as I said, the question is ideology and what we want to do as women. Um, you know, one of the things in the Black Panther Party is that people said, well, you know, you had all those brothers. You know, I've suffered. I've suffered at the hands of a whole lot of people. But, uh, you know, we had brothers in the party that were this or that or the other. But I remember in the beginning when I was... And this is just an example of what I mean. <laughs> when I was in the party and uh, we were sleeping on the floor, which is where we, I slept for like seven of the, of the ten years I was in the party. Um, and it was in L.A. and this brother tried to crawl into my sleeping bag, you know. And I, I didn't know what you were supposed to say about stuff like that other than, you know, no or whatever. I mean, I, I backed away and all that. I knew what to do for myself. But I didn't know how to deal with it in the context of the Black Panther. Anyway, I went to John Huggins. Uh, who was uh, one of my uh, heroes and was uh, sadly assassinated, as you probably know. Uh, and I asked John, I said, what should I do? I mean, this guy comes over, he's trying to get into my sleeping bag, you know, what am I supposed to do about that? He said, just a minute, I'll be right back. He said, here, sleep with this, and he handed me a hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to assure you that there's something about a hatchet that will keep your average molesting, raping, thinking person out of your life, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I slept with the hatchet, I really did. And so I say that to say there was a practical solution there that, that, that immediately had an effect. And, and, and really, we weren't as weak as some of the people I see today. I mean, there's some women around here right now that are they're crying and carrying on. I, I'll give you another quick example and then I'll close with this. I was speaking at a Connecticut, some school in Connecticut recently, and they had a, uh, an editorial, a guy had put an editorial in the paper, a guy had put a front page editorial, he was an editorial editor, whatever, and it said, why rape could be a magical experience. And everybody on the campus was mad of all the women that did exactly what you did. That was like crying and crying, and I arrived at the campus, I'm tired, I'm going to take one of them dark 100 flights like I did today. <laughs> I'm tired, they're talking about, oh, we don't know what to do. I said, what you mean you don't know what to do? What the hell are you talking about? Somebody writes an article like this, and they're like, well, he has a right of free speech. And then we went to the sponsor, the school sponsor, and then we did this, and then we did that. I'm like, well, wait a minute, what happened to this? Get some spunk up in here, okay? I said, now, okay, so you haven't kicked his ass by now, so I see that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> but why don't you go down to the school newspaper, Lock that bad boy down until they get rid of him. They were like, well, they told us this now. So what's going to happen to you? You going to get killed? Do you think, how do you think you've got the women's studies programs? Because people sat in and slapped people around. And to, I mean, it's the truth. Look at the history of this. It all started around somewhere around 68, 69, or 70, 71. Or every one of these black studies, women's studies, women's centers, all. It started because people sat in at these schools. Nobody sat around here talking about, well, should we write a letter to the provost? No, we're going to kick the provost's we gonna kick the provost ass, okay? Provost better show up with up. So wait a minute. So I said, what is wrong with you? Why are you sitting up here talking about free speech? I said, first of all, let's examine free speech, and I'm going to do this very quickly. You, there is speech that all speech is not protected under the law since your ass is dealing with the law, okay? I'm not dealing with the law. I consider myself being outlawed in the first place. Well, even now, even as we speak. But anyway, so I said, but you're going to deal with the law, the school law, free speech? No, he doesn't have the right to advocate crime. Okay, you advocate rape because he said the reason it's a magical experience 
He says, because even in prison, it's magical for men to get raped because that gives them something to do with an otherwise boring day. And why ugly women are better off for being raped and not having a man. And all kinds of nasty stuff that he put in his art. Everybody's crying and crying. I said, what's the point? What are you going to do about it? You want to sit here and cry about it? But I finished with him, and I called him out at the speech and everything. I said, where is he? You know, I said, let's duke it out right now, okay? <laughs> so, you know, I said, look, I'm 64. You might win. You know, but I don't think so, because I'm also crafty and crazy. And stuff, you know? I'm looking for stuff right now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> My mother used to say, it won't be no fight. It's going to be two hits. I'm going to hit you. You're going to hit the floor, right? So... <laughs> I'm not looking for a fight, but, you know, let's duke it out. But he wouldn't show up anywhere. So I said, look, when I finished talking to the socialist women, the lesbian gay club, the women's center, and the blacks all formed a coalition. And guess what they called themselves in my honor? The Pink Panthers. <laughs> and they went down to the next day after I left. They went down to the, to the newspaper, called CNN, had rolling tape rolling and had all these people saying, we want the head of whatever his name was. They fired the boy. Then they made him come to a forum and apologize. They had the front page of the Boston Globe, the front page of the Hartford Current, and they had CNN tape, and they were number one little video story on CNN, and they felt good about themselves. That's the difference. They sitting around here, there's a whole bunch of women around here whining right now that don't know how to take any action. You got to take some action, not be afraid. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to lose your scholarship? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're more concerned with your diet and your, your hair and your tattoos and your, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is all good to me because that, that came out of our generation, all that crazy stuff. But we like, like, well, look at my hair. Look, I'm going to be 64 years old. You know what I mean? I'm a little bit crazy. But, but my point is, you got to take some action, and I use that as the clearest example. Once I gave them a little idea about how they could do it, they didn't get hurt. Nobody got hurt. I told them, I said, let me tell you something. The next person, I said, and then another thing, you have to have somebody lined up to take his place that's going to write what you want. This ain't no freedom of the press stuff. When's the last time you had a big op-ed in the New York Times? Unless you got a Bloomingdale's ad, you won't be seen in the New York Times too often, okay? So there ain't no freedom of the press. You got to take it where you can find it. And sit up here crying about Don Imus, crying about Michael Richards, crying about some guy saying that rape is a magical experience. I said, you should have messed him up. But since you didn't do that, let's go to plan B. <laughs> and they did. And they did it. And you know what? They felt great because you know what? It was a goal, and they did it right there on that campus. And I'm telling you, you can look it up. It was Connecticut, like February of this year. Next question. Action is supreme. Yes? Hi. Yes? Well, well, let me give you the let me give you the bottom line, and you you can buy, you don't have to bottom you don't have to give it to her exactly. You can give it to her in the way that you know I mean it from the vernacular, because this is not going to be pure English, okay? Now we know first of all that everything happening in Colombia is supported by the United States government, so that's the first thing you have to know in order to know how to address a problem. You got to know. You had to get a solution, you had to know what the problem is. The problem is this, co this country, as you well know, props up the government of Colombia, along with the other uh, cocaine-producing uh, <laughs> countries. Unfortunately, not Bolivia anymore, thanks to Evo Morales. Let's have a little cheer for Evo, Evo Morales. Okay. So I don't know Colombia, so I can't talk about the particulars of Colombia but I can talk about what is going on in South America that we have never seen in this world. We have, I'm trying to get to Venezuela as we speak. 
I'm only, I'm only living to go to Venezuela right now. <laughs> My every breath is to get to Venezuela because the South Americans are showing us something. Yeah. They have elected not only uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, not only Hugo Chavez in, uh, in, uh, Venezuela. in Venezuela, but what, who, what's the man's name in Ecuador? Somebody help me. Um, you know who I'm talking about, Ecuador. But the most important, most incredible election, which is not exactly South America, but Central America, is the election of Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Yeah. After all that we've all gone through for the support of these Contras, mm -hmm. Daniel Ortega held the line, the Sandinistas held the line, and they got back through the ballot, despite the bullet, just like Hamas did after all those Palestinian struggles and hijackings and everything else, just like the Hezbollah and so forth and so on. I can only say this, the same thing I'm saying to, these, to the people here and to, to myself, that words are beautiful, but actions are supreme. There is no message other than that we are part of you and you are part of us, that we are in solidarity with all oppressed women. But believe me, the women of Iraq are suffering a whole lot more, being raped by American troops and other Iraqis and whatever else is going on because we don't know so we never hear it. And so we are in solidarity, but in terms of the particulars of that community, because it's not a country anymore. It's under the thumb of the United States of, of America. You know, Huey Newton used to ask, what's the difference between Africans living in Harlem and Africans living in Harare? And the answer is nothing. Same, people, same community, same oppression, same oppressor. Your oppressor is the same one that oppresses us in the large picture of things. But in terms of day-to-day -day activities, you have to decide the danger levels and what you're capable of doing. I'm not going to sit up here and tell somebody to take arms against a sea of troubles when you're subject to get beat down and beat back just the way we did in the Black Panther Party. But of course, in the end of the day, it's going to take a rising up of the majority of people. And you'll have to be in link with us because we know that it's George Bush that's feeding that Colombian machine. And we know, and we know why. And so I just say to you that um, we are in solidarity with the women of Colombia as the women of all oppressed around the world. And that's the only message that we can deliver, but it's not a meaningful one other than, than its words. But actions on your part are what you can do. But you can teach us what to do and we can support you. And that's another thing that, that I think we can do. So I'll take one more question. Can we make an announcement? Yes, make an announcement. which happens to be Malcolm X's birthday, which we all love. So, anyway, we have some... Ho Chi Minh, too? Oh, go ahead. Where, oh, where is it? it is, is it here in, in D.C.? It's, it's uh, very close to the West United Methodist Church. Okay. So, in any case, there are flags. But people who live here, uh, you should go and, so, and begin to, uh, to uh, show that kind of uh, solidarity and find out what we can do, if anything, uh, because most of us are, uh, have our own form of, of dealing with life, and, and, and so it's, it's a universal or a global movement that we have to really uh, put together. Should I take one more quick question? Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Roger James, and I was wondering how much of a role you think Ron Reagan played in the demise of the Black Panther Party and possible assassination of members of the Black Panther Possible assassination of? Of the um, members of the Black Panther Oh, well. Well, Ronald Reagan came in and the party was just about over. Um, when was he, 1982, something like that? He was a governor of California, yeah. But I mean, you know, one individual, I mean, listen, it's like what role does Bush have in the war in Iraq? Really very little when you consider that the whole Congress voted for the war, with the exception of my friend Barbara Lee. Everybody, everybody on that first round voted to put money up for this war. And people still run around here like Barack Obama talking about Al-Qaeda. What the hell does that mean? I don't even know what that means. It's, it's like Kilroy was here. You know what I mean? What, what is Al-Qaeda? You know, I've been living 64 years successfully. I know who the enemy was, and I've so far never heard Al-Qaeda was a problem for me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but so I wouldn't necessarily put anything on Ronald Reagan anymore than I would on Bush per se, which isn't to say, but I mean, it's like we, for, we put stuff on Bush and forget about Clinton. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's what Clinton has been sliding through and his wife is sliding through. You got black folks here talking about, I just like Hillary, you know? I, I just like, I don't know, I can't tell you. I said, you like Miss Ann. That's because, you know, that, that's that slave piece, you know? You just love Miss Ann so much. You can't have Massa, you just willing to bow down to Miss Ann because that's all she is, is his wife. What else is she? 
She has no other credential on the planet other than she's the wife of Bill Clinton. And that's all I'm going to give her credit for, too. She doesn't even get to be called a woman of herself. She's his wife and his extension. And so Ronald Reagan is no different than, than Bush. But in the end of the day, it's the same system that has been in place since 16-something. Just got bigger and bigger and bigger after World War II. It really got big. And so when you go from Truman bombing the, the Japanese people back into oblivion, into buying and making Motorola TVs and stuff, and you go from... from from, from 1945 forward, the only thing that changed was the names of the, of the people. And that includes Kennedy, who, remember, opened up the doors to Vietnam now. And that includes uh, certainly Johnson, and it certainly includes Carter, because thanks to Carter, we have Noriega. Thanks to Carter, we had the invasion of Somalia. So Carter likes to pretend that his hands are clean. What'd you say? He's what? Oh, East Timor. I just didn't hear what you said. Yeah, I mean, it go, I mean, if we were to analyze Carter, I mean, so they all kept the line going. The variation on the theme and the style, and this one was a little more aggressive, and Clinton was more black, you know, because uh, he had some thick lips, I guess, and his hair. <laughs> and, you know, you saw the hair. We were all trying to tell that daughter to get some dark and lovely, you know what I mean? <laughs> and y'all have to know what that means. It's just silly, isn't it? Isn't that silly that I said that? But anyway, that's just, that's just ridiculous that I was saying. Don't film that stuff. But you know what I'm saying. Black folks ran around here thinking that Clinton was okay, but Bush is bad. Or Carter has now become a man of peace. But Carter suddenly becomes, you notice this? He's some kind of man of peace. He's erased his whole racist history in America's Georgia. You know he was an ex clan His daddy was, he didn't make his money from peanut farming. His family made money from cotton farming. Talking about, oh, I lived, all my neighbors were black. No, they weren't your neighbors. Those were your sharecroppers. <laughs> See? So Carter walks around, you know, in this kind of cloud of like, he's not like Ronald Reagan. No. He's the same person. He gave us Noriega. Right? And Noriega, because remember when they were getting ready, <laughs> told Carter they were going to uh, blow up uh, the, uh, the Panama Canal. Suddenly the president got killed in Noriega, that pedophile tr drug trafficker that was trained at, in Georgia at the School yeah. of the Americas at yeah. Fort Benning, was Carter's purse. Carter put that boy in. So we forget there's no difference. It's just Ronald Reagan might have had a little, he had like crude, he was a little cruder, you know, or like Bush, kind of crude. Wait a minute, can I just say this last thing? Is anybody embarrassed by those Black folks playing those drums with that fool stand. Oh my! I was like, oh, what? I have to hang my head in shame. All those African drummers and dancers, those West Africans, sitting up there, and he and Laura sitting up there jumping around like they're from the uh, from the uh, from some kind of African uh, 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 village or something. It, oh my God! It was like Bawana. I was, it was it was like the most racist thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, did you see it? Yeah. But that kept our minds off the war, didn't it? <laughs> so I think that remembering this, that you remember Reagan came in on the October, so-called October surprise, where he made a deal with the Ayatollah, made another deal to support the Contras, got crack co the cocaine dumped into our communities. Yeah, Reagan had a special place. But I don't say that it's much different in any qualitative way. There are nuances of difference, but I certainly don't think that he's single-handedly responsible for very much because one of the things, and that's why I'm running for office, I'm hoping some of you will say, I need to be in the Congress. D.C., I don't even know why they want to be a state. Why don't they just say, look, we got a good moment here. Let's declare. Let's secede, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we ain't part of the United States anyway. What the heck? What, what is your point? Why are you begging to be a, you want to be in this mess? You see? So there are things that we can do to make that change on the electoral piece, but I don't think there's, and, and that's why I think we need to change the Congress and take out some of these total reactionaries and get some people in there who would have voted against the war and at least raise some, some consciousness about it. But I don't think Ronald Reagan was particularly any more egregious except for the cocaine. I think if, any, if he did anything that was more than anyone else, it was the uh, dumping of cocaine, uh, massive quantities through helping the, the, the Contras. Uh, who were operating out of Honduras, and all of that to have Daniel Ortega uh, come back victorious. So I hope that you guys will talk about agenda, come together, let us get back to movement in this country. Let us try to build a movement among all of the people who are progressive thinking, who are oppressed people, and develop uh, a way that we can really make the kind of change we can not bring back, but in fact install power uh, to the people. Thanks a lot. <laughs>